Pastor Miller. Am I on? Okay, here we go. So it's a good morning. No, I said it's a good morning. <laughs> I already greeted you good morning, but it's a good morning. <laughs> so this morning we are going to, I'm going to start on, uh, on a topic, and if we get through it, great. If not, then I will pick up next week. But uh, it's, it is freedom. Did y'all kind of guess what I, what I was preaching on this morning? Okay. <clears throat> All right. I, I can tell you this. Uh, I, I had some songs that I wanted to, that I wanted to do this morning, and, uh, and I meant to get them to John earlier in the week, and, and that didn't happen. And so last night, I, I sent them to him, and I'm like, as a text, I think it was probably about 9 o'clock, I said, hey, you need to get these three songs in tomorrow? And he goes, sure. I'm like, I'm not even used to that. <laughs> Normally, normally I'm, I'm working on them, you know, and then I have to set up the PowerPoints. I have to do everything. I'm not used to that, you know. And then this morning when, when things start, you know, I'm like, okay, I think I should get up there. Wait a minute. Am I supposed to get up there? Who's supposed to get up there and open the service? <laughs> so, so we're, what's that? I know. I'm like, I don't know what to do. We're, we're kind of lost, aren't we? I'm just joking. Now, we, we are transitioning and we're trying to, to get things get things going. Um, and you know, part of it is as, I, as I, I come and I start to notice, I start to notice more and more. It's like, okay, well, that, we need to talk about that. Oh, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about that. And then uh, I hit the road and go, to, go back to San Marcos and I'm like, oh, we need to talk about this, 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 this. And it's a hundred things that hit, line up. And when I get home, I forget all of them. <laughs> Don't tell them I'm texting and driving. <laughs> no, it's, it's hands-free, honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, this morning we're going we're gonna to talk about freedom, unrestrained citizenship. Um, as I've said, you'll, you'll start to notice that there is a common theme and a common language that, that I am trying to introduce into everyone. Okay, you know that in a culture, you know what culture they're from or you know what country they're from because of the language they speak, because of maybe how they dress or maybe they all have a very similar color of skin or dialect or whatever. And so one of the things that's very important is that in the kingdom of God and in, in our gospel walk, there should be a language that we have that everyone knows that we're not the same. Yes. How, how many of y'all know that you're not, you're not from this world? Right. This is not our home. So we are citizens of the United States, but we are citizens of the Most High first. And I think sometimes we forget that, and we want to focus more on our U.S. citizenship than our citizenship in God. And so I just want to remind us for, for this today and maybe even next week as we, as we move through this about our citizenship and what it means. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 17, the songs that we sang are actually out of this verse. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Say freedom. 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 Have y'all never seen Braveheart? Anybody seen Braveheart? Remember, the, he's laying on there, and he, he refuses to beg for mercy. And one of the last things he says, he says what? That's not how he says it. So we're, this morning, we're going to say, just like Braveheart said it, okay? On the count of three, I want you to shout freedom. One, two, three. Freedom! Thank you. If, if you believe what you say, then you should be excited about what you believe. Yes. I don't want to be the only one excited about the kingdom. Because I'm going to be excited no matter what. I don't know how to be any other way. So we need to start being excited about the language that we speak. We need to be excited about the, the kingdom that we're walking in. So now the, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Okay, you can say liberty. I'm okay with that. But y'all still didn't get it. You know, we're not going to move on until we get this. <laughs> One more time. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is that's better. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. 
We are spiritual beings. We are not fleshly beings. We have this shell that we walk in, but God has deposited his spirit in us. Amen. That's what differentiates us from the rest of the world. You may look like you did before you got saved, but you are not the same as you were before you got saved. Something was transformed in us. And unless it is manifest by evidentiary proof, then how is the world going to know that Jesus is in us? See, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. King James says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty, in the Amplified, it goes on to say, emancipation from bondage. Emancipation from bondage. What bondage? The curse. Sin. This flesh. We've been emancipated from all things that are of this earth into a heavenly citizenship. Is this new language? Y'all never heard this before? <laughs> okay, just... Maybe I'm just preaching to the choir, but I'm pretty excited about this. Let me, let me give you kind of a, a new definition to kind of understand. Liberty means unrestrained. It means unrestrained, and it means protected in that unrestraint. See, in our country, we have liberties that are protected, and those liberties are unrestrained. Freedom is citizenship to exercise our protected liberty. See, so we use them interchangeable, but in actuality, they're cooperative one with another. Liberty is the unrestraint that we have to operate in our freedom. Without liberty, we can't exercise our citizenship. It's a tough crowd this morning. <laughs> Five attributes we're going to walk through th this morning. Let's go to Luke chapter 4. Actually, yeah, I'll let you all go there. I wasn't going to, but we'll go there. Luke chapter 4, verses 8. 18 and 19. I told them, I said, there's some read scriptures and then there's just some sight scriptures. And this is a sight scripture, but we'll read it this morning. Y'all know the difference? Okay. Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is Jesus in the temple reading out of Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 2. And he's, he's stating it and then after he says, Today this word this is fulfilled in your ears. Meaning that today liberty has come upon God's people. And the moment that we accepted Jesus, that same liberty that he's speaking of here has come upon us. And when we tell people, when we tell people about Jesus and we lead them into, into Christ and, and we see the transformational process take place in them, that same fulfillment is now in them. See, as Americans, we have no trouble exercising our patriotism. None. But if you, just, if you would just go watch social media just for a day or two, you see more patriotism come out of God's people than you see their citizenship in God. Now, I understand. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being patriotic. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. We did not get to choose what country we were born in. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not anti-American. I'm not anti-patriotism. I love this country. I serve this country. I know what it means. But there is a greater citizenship that supersedes my citizenship in the U.S. And that citizenship is not bound by borders. My passport allows me to get out of this country and go into another country, but my citizenship in God allows me to operate no matter where I'm at in the world. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. Romans 8, 
There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. Say free. Free. In Christ Jesus for the law of sin and death. From the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. In us, who walk according to the flesh, but who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. When we operate more as an American than we do as one of God's children, is that the flesh or the spirit? Which is the greater citizenship? Our citizenship in our country or the citizenship in Christ? And that's what he's saying. So if we're operating in this, understand, we have rights that are, 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 are conferred to us by our constitution. I'm not trying to take those away. And we, we have a duty as a citizen of this country to exercise those rights, correct? We are, we're in an election year. Are we not? So it is very important for everybody to exercise their civil right. See, civil rights... <laughs> is the right to exercise this citizenship, this freedom, this liberty. And it has been conferred upon all mankind who are citizens of this country. You know, I hear people say, why should I vote? Because my vote doesn't matter. That is a good point. And when 300 million people say the exact same thing, then we get the result that we get. 50% of our eligible voting population does not vote. Let me rephrase that. 50% of our eligible voting population do not cast their vote, but their lack of casting a vote actually cast a vote. So they say, well, my vote doesn't matter. And in reality, what happens, their lack of voting carries more weight. Not exercising our citizenship as a, a U.S. citizen is detrimental because we actually are contributors to whomever gets placed in office. You know, I always tell people, I said, look, when they want to complain about the government or the whatever, I say, did you vote this year? Are you a voting age? Yes. Are you registered to vote? No. Then shame on you. Close your mouth. If we, if we do not cast a vote, if we're not invested in, in the citizenship, then you have no right to speak against it. You have said that no matter what happens, I'm okay with it. So you got exactly what you expected. How much more is that as a believer? Verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. Our citizenship also comes with absolute power in Christ. See, and as an American citizen, all we get to do is cast a vote. As a citizen of the Most High, we get to pray. We get to speak His Word. We get to exercise that citizenship however we want to. These hands and feet can exercise the anointing that is in us because of the citizen of Christ. And no government can oppress that. No government can take that away from us. Peter said, or Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be with, to be with Christ. So the only thing they can do is, is still destroy and, and, and bring this body down. But they cannot take away our citizenship in Christ. I can lose my citizenship as an American, 
But I cannot lose my citizenship as a, a child of Jesus. No one can take that away. So that is a right no matter where that no one can steal from me. You can't take what has already been given over. That's what Jesus said to Pilate. Pilate said, don't you know I have the power to crucify you? He says, you have no power except that which I've suffered you to have. The power for, that Pilate had to crucify Jesus was because Jesus gave it to him. So the only power that anyone, a government, has over us is what we have submitted to them. And the only power that we can change of that government that has power over us is what we submit to be changed. See, we're the only government in the entire world that has the opportunity to exercise our citizenship with the providence of God's hand upon it. That was a shouting moment. Do you know if I, if I was preaching this in another country, there'd be armed guards I probably would have already been ushered away. Yeah. It would have stuck me in a cell far, far away and nobody would have ever heard of me again. But as a citizen of the Most High and a citizen of this country, I have the freedom and liberty to share what the Lord says to us. So there is a power in this citizenship that we possess that we don't have as an American. But as an American, this citizenship can press through that and touch our nation. Yeah. Look, I'm going to give you a revelation. The U.S. is not a Christian nation. Okay? What? It's not a Christian. Look, the, the, the nation is amoral. It's just like this chair. It can't, it, the nation doesn't know good nor evil. Just like this chair knows good or evil. As long as this chair is sitting here, it, it has a good purpose. I can sit on it, right? I can stack it. I can rearrange it, but if I pick it up and hit him over the head. Thank you. The chair is amoral. The nation is amoral. It is the people that make up the nation. What do you know that the kingdom of God is amoral? The kingdom of God cannot and will not accomplish anything without you. That's not a limitation of God. That's how God has set it in motion. Just like our nation has a constitution and a bill of rights and amendments that give us the authority to operate in that, God has put down his law in Christ through grace and mercy and forgiveness. And that is the law and commandment or the constitution and bylaw, however you want to look at it, that we're to operate in. But without God's people, there is no kingdom. John, not getting enough sleep this morning? <laughs> John 4, 24, God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. So number one, we must be filled with the spirit. That is the first attribute of, of having freedom in Christ and an unrestrained citizenship. Without the spirit, nothing can be accomplished in the kingdom. Without the Spirit, nothing can be accomplished in the kingdom. <laughs> Come on now. I got nowhere to be. We, we don't eat much, so if y'all get hungry, we're okay. We'll just go run it off later. So number one, we must be filled with the Spirit. Without the Spirit, we can do nothing in Christ. Do you notice that the disciples in Acts chapter 2, or Acts chapter 1, they were gathered together, and Jesus, and, they, and Jesus appeared to them, and he said, is it now the time that you're going to restore and establish your kingdom? And he said, you don't know the time or the, or the, or the, or the, or the moment that God has established in his own power. And he says, then you will receive power to be my witnesses. So go carry until they receive the power from on high. They did nothing until the Holy Spirit was poured out into them. If you look at their language prior to the day of Pentecost and look at their language after the day of Pentecost, you see a dramatic difference, a transformation. They were pretty weak-minded when Jesus was standing in front of them. 
They were operating in the flesh when they had the fullness of the Spirit right before their very eyes. And so it wasn't until that same Spirit that was in Jesus endued them and filled them and baptized them that they were able to operate as Christ operated on the earth. And then it was from that moment that their freedom and their citizenship became real and manifested. Look, John 15, 19, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world hates you. Why do we feel like we're being persecuted? I said this before, it's not Satan. He is a singular being that has no ability to be everywhere at the same time. If you're standing here in Beeville and saying, oh my God, God was beating the food bar out of me this morning, and somebody in China saying, oh my God, Satan's beating the food bar out of me this morning, or this, this evening, he can't be in both places. Y'all understand that, right? So if everybody in this room said, man, Satan's really giving me trouble this morning, man, he's pretty fast. He's a singular being. Not omnipresent like God. You, we got to get that and understand it. It is not Satan that is beating us up. It is not Satan that is, is, is persecuting us. The world hates you. The world doesn't like you. The world doesn't like me. It is the world. It is this flesh that we live in, that we walk in. This is corruptible. When I'm hurting in the morning, I'm not going to blame Satan. It's the almost thousand miles of being in my truck this last week. <laughs> it was the sleeping on a, on a hard bed the other night. It's something else. It's not Satan. It's this flesh. It's this world. It's something else that's doing it. And I have to get up and navigate through it. I have to be free and unrestrained with the anointing with me to move this flesh into action. Yes. Oh, man. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. I don't need amens, but they sure help us move along. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Be subject, <laughs> be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. You know, come football season, y'all are in trouble because I don't like the Cowboys. <laughs> 11 o'clock kickoff time means absolutely nothing to me. Because I can catch them at halftime and still get my nap in. <laughs> First Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free. Not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Did you hear that? Honor the emperor. Yes. This is the word. When we bash our president, when we bash our congressmen, when we bash our city council, when we bash our elected officials, we are not honoring the emperor. We don't honor the emperor because of the person that's in the, in the position. We honor the emperor as unto Christ. Because honoring the position that Christ's authority is over is good. I, that's hard to swallow, isn't it? If, if you want to do something different, then let's rise up. Let's have a registration campaign. And let's make sure everybody goes out and cast their vote to get rid of the bad emperor. But the emperor that is currently in office, we must pray for and honor. Because God has instituted them to be in that position. 
Like that's why our nation is the way. We have a peaceful transfer of power. Or if you want to put it, it is, it is a virtual coup every two, four, and six years. And when I say it's a virtual coup, it's because we don't have battles. We don't have civil war. If somebody loses the election, well, they'll take somebody to court, but we don't pull out guns. A few years ago, the Kenya went through a massive election. The, the one that everyone believed won the election, when it was announced, didn't get announced as the one who won the election. They came from two separate tribes. They pulled out their machetes and spears and guns and started killing each other. That doesn't happen every four years. We don't operate that way. We are civil people. So if you don't like what you're seeing in the government, it is temporal, but we all have a responsibility. Let's go change it as unto Christ. John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would be fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Your kingdom is not from this world. Right. Romans 12 and 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So item number two, the second attribute of, a, of a, an unrestrained citizen is we are not of this world. We are passing through aliens, sojourners, the King James says. We're just on our way. You know, I don't know about you, but when I pass from, you know, one store to another store, as I'm going to the place that I want to be at, even as a man, I'm still pretty quick and want to get to where I'm at, but if something catches my eye, I stop. Most of the time, something catches somebody else's eye and I'm forced to stop. <laughs> but nevertheless, we stop and we engage in everything along the way. It's not our final destination. But along the way, we are able to interact and engage in, in the things around us. Enjoy the things around us. Yesterday, somebody wanted to run. This somebody did not want to run. This somebody was exhausted and hurting. Last thing I wanted to do was run. You know? And so she says, I got to go. And she takes off. Has no idea where she's going. The trail's not really marked very, very good where we're at. And I'm just like, okay. And so I'm walking. Man, I'm enjoying the cows. There's a couple bison out there. I hear water. And it's like, man, this is pretty cool. And I'm just chilling. Well, guess who comes back? She's like, I, I, I said, oh, you missed the waterfall, didn't you? Yeah, I never saw the waterfall. <laughs> That's because you're running. <laughs> Let's walk. And so we start walking, and she goes, I went down this way. I said, but you didn't go the way I went. <laughs> and so we get down there, and, I, and I, I kind of tell her what's going on, and I say, I see the river over here. And as I look up, and go, oh, look at there. There's a little red dot where we're supposed to go. I was walking. I had a destination. I, I wanted to do four miles while I'm walking. But while I was walking, I wanted to enjoy the journey. I wanted to embrace the journey. I wanted to influence the journey. An opportunity where I can talk to God in, in the peace and the serenity and the quiet. And she finished the last mile and a half with me. We still got to the destination. See, that's, that's how we are. We're passing through. Our life should not be this turmoil. This shouldn't be this stress. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be everything is just weighing down on us. This, this is a journey. We should be able to enjoy each other. Amen. And enjoy the things that God has created. Yes, heaven is going to be wonderful. Okay? I'm not going to tell you what it looks like because I don't know. I've never been there. And anybody who says they know what it looks like and they've been there, mm, I would question that. But that's me. I've been to Kenya, I can tell you what it looks like. I've been to Uganda, I've been to Italy, I've been to England, I've been to Germany. I can tell you what those places look like, because I've been there. Never been to heaven. I won't even try to describe it to you. But while I'm here, I know that's there. I want to interact and engage and influence everything I can here for the kingdom. Yes. 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 Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. 
You know, when you're on a journey, you pick things up along the way and you take them with you. Yeah. Why? So that when you get to the destination, you get to enjoy them with you. Amen. See, we want to get to heaven and we don't want to take anybody with us. We just want to get there. Lord, take me now. I'll fly away. Let me get to heaven. Blah, blah, blah. So how many people did you talk to and tell them about me? Oh, no, I just want to get here as fast as I can. We're not of this world. We are of a spirit world that our world has no knowledge of. And the only way that they can have a glimpse of our world is when we share Christ with them. Why, why do people want to come to America? Because they heard of the land with endless opportunity. They heard, I can go and I can practice my faith. I can actually start a business on my own. I can, I can have land. I mean, all I have to do is go run as fast as I can and put stakes in the ground and the land that's between those stakes is mine. Y'all know that's how it was in Oklahoma, right? Many people just would run, and that's as fast as you and your family can run and put the four stakes in the ground, everything in between it with your name was yours. In most countries, the land is owned by the government. 21 acres of land, how much would that cost here? Give me a... How much? 250,000, roughly. 250,000 for 21 acres of land. Everyone kind of agree? Can you get a consensus? 300,000? Higher, lower? Lower? Okay, let's, let's just say 150, 175,000. Can we settle on 5,000? Okay, that same 21 acres of land in Kenya is $2.5 million US. Undeveloped. That's where we're looking to put a school and a, 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 an orphan family center, orphan and widow family center. $2.5 million, 21 acres of land, because it's owned by a government official. I could get the same land here for a lot cheaper. So we have some freedoms that other countries don't get to enjoy. Benjamin Franklin wrote, in the truest sense, freedom cannot be bestowed. It must be achieved. We are, we are born into a nation where liberty and freedom is conferred upon a person. But if they refuse to walk in that liberty and freedom, then they're not exercising their citizenship. You have people right now who have rebelled and refused to operate in their liberty and freedom. In fact, they took too much liberty and freedom. And now they are locked up because they didn't walk through as a true citizen. And I'm not gonna debate the rights or wrongs or what's fair, what's not fair, it's a, it's a fact. If we break the law, then we suffer the consequence. But we have a privilege to operate within the fullness of our citizenship. And when we do, we get to enjoy the benefits of that citizenship. Freedom is only achieved through one method. Death. Our freedom and liberty came through the bloodshed and deaths of those that went before us yeah. as a citizen of the U.S. Our freedom and liberty in Christ came through the death of the Son of God. Freedom cannot come any other way but through death. And how do we engage into this freedom and liberty in Christ? We must die to ourselves. Yeah. I don't know about you, but when somebody sacrifices the ultimate gift for me, that means a lot. Yes, Lord. Yes. How, how, many, how many U.S. soldiers, whether we agree with, with how we got here or not, 
but how many of them with their fullness of their heart and the intentionality that they were serving a, something greater than themselves sacrificed their life? They don't know who you are. They don't know who I am. We don't know who they are, but they did it nonetheless. And how much more is a Savior who knows every hair on our bodies? He intimately knows everything about us. He was there when we were formed and fashioned <laughs> and deposited in our mother's womb. He knows us better than anyone, anywhere. And he sacrificed his life for us. How much, how, how much more should that motivate and drive us to exercise and walk in what he's given us? If I just bought my truck and left it in the driveway and never drove it, what good is the truck doing me? <laughs> Did I tell you all about my holiness? My, about my mug? I didn't tell you all about my mug? So I got this mug, right? <clears throat> I was asked one time, what does holiness mean? And I've been taught that holiness means to be set apart for use. I didn't tell you all that? Yeah, you did. Okay, thought so. <laughs> See, don't make me retell a story. Who hadn't heard it? Because I love telling stories. Okay, come get with me afterwards. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 15 through 17 says, Therefore, he, being Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since the death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. We have a, a, a will, an inheritance that Jesus has bought and paid for. The last will and testament of Christ is to confer all things to you. We don't have to go to litigation. We don't have to go to mediation. We don't have to go to estate plan. We don't have to go see a lawyer. It is given to you the minute that you receive him as Lord and Savior. Amen. Period. You have a righteous inheritance as a citizen of the Most High the moment he died. And then he sent you a comforter. Someone who leads you in how to operate in that inheritance. You know, when a child receives the throne from an adult monarchy that dies, the child has not come to a, an age of responsibility, okay? Or an age of accountability, and so a trusted confidant, a trusted comforter, a trusted advisor that the family has entrusted raises this child, teaches this child in all things of their family history, teaches this child in all things on how to operate as a righteous ruler, gives them everything they, they need so that on the day that they are old enough and accountable enough, they can exercise the fullness of authority of the royal family that they have received the inheritance from. When we were babes in Christ, guess what? That was us. We were the child ruler. And the Holy Spirit had to raise us up. The Holy Spirit would put physical mentors beside us to raise us up and to help disciple us in the things of Christ. And then at some point, we are fully transformed to walk in that. Sometimes I think we feel like we're still in that baby infant stage. We're not ready to take the, thr the, the, the throne or the crown. We're not above Jesus. But he made it perfectly clear that we will accomplish everything he accomplished and greater. Jesus is not afraid of allowing us to do more than he did. You understand that? He doesn't have, he's not too prideful to say, oh, hey, man, I really don't want them to be better than me. Remember Saul? People were saying, well, Saul killed his hundreds, right? 
But David killed his thousands. Saul didn't like that. He didn't realize that, that he could have been part of raising David. He could have been part of nurturing David. He, he could have been, you know, a, someone that gave David all the confidence he needed here. David struggled. He had a rough time. Paul, or Saul was trying to kill him. If Saul realized that he was part of the solution and not the problem, imagine what would have happened in that transferring of authority from Saul to David. It wouldn't have been like it was. But Paul was, or Saul was jealous. He had pride. That's not our Jesus. Our biggest cheerleader is Jesus. You know, my wife, I'm her biggest fan. I'm her biggest cheerleader. Even when she, when she feels that she, she doesn't really feel like she possesses everything she needs to step into something, but she, her heart is full of desire, she has the passion to go do it, I'm right there saying, let's go, baby. And I'm, I'm, I'm pushing her, and I'm watching, I'm looking, I'm making sure, you got this, babe. I'm behind you all the way. I want everyone to see your face. I want everyone to know that it, this is you and not James. And the moment that they step in front of you and they try to stop you, they try to hinder you, they try to get in your way, I'm going to jump in front of you and take care of business. Yes. That's our Jesus. That's the same example of what Jesus does for us. You know, Wayne, Wayne, I want you to go. I don't just want you to be successful in business. Man, I'm going to put you out there, Wayne. I'm going to have you tell people about me. I'm going to have your life be a beacon on a hill. Everywhere you go, the atmosphere is going to change. There's going to be a peace that is affected. Everywhere you go, Wayne, no matter what you do, you're going to smile. It's going to disarm people. You're going to give them stuff. You're going to bless them. You're going to do everything. And when they try to stop you, Wayne, I'm going to get in front of you. Jesus wants you to be great in this earth, not for your own greatness, but because he is great in you. Romans chapter 6. Beginning in verse 1. Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. In order... That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Death no longer has mastery over you. <laughs> do, do, we, do we understand? I mean, really understand that? Death has no mastery over us. Jesus went to hell and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and he gave them to you. Look, you know why Jesus was not afraid to go to the cross? Because you can't take from somebody something from someone that they've already given up. When, you, when we truly understand that we are a dead man, then we will no longer fear death. Every fear known to man comes from the fear of death. When we master that fear, 
Shame will no longer be a problem. Embarrassment will no longer be a problem. The fear of failure will no longer be a problem. Every fear that we have in our lives will be gone because he satisfied it. I had a friend ask me one time when we went through our accident. He said, so if, uh, if, you, if your wife and child had died, pretty morbid, but okay, I'll play your game. If your wife and child had died in the accident and you survived, would you still serve God? That's pretty twisted, huh? And I said, why wouldn't I? And she goes, how could you? I said, wouldn't you blame God for what happened? I said, no. I said, because they know who they are in Christ. <laughs> I'd be sad. I'd be angry. I'd have to process through all of those emotions. And yes, I might shake my fist at God a couple times or two. But in the end, I know the truth. That they already died. And this was just a transferring into glory. You see, and she goes, well, how how could you do that? And and, and, and how, I mean, would you still go on the mission field? What, What if something happens on the mission field? I said, you know what the greatest tragedy would have been? Is that we died a mile from our home. In our car. Not doing anything we weren't supposed to be doing, but headed back to our house. That would have been the greatest tragedy. I said, but to die on the mission field? (laughs) Bring it on. (laughs) Because you can't take what I've already given up. How how can I do and go and and be the things that I do now? It's because I have no fear of what man can do to me. None. We we were in a kind of a conference and and a leadership meeting the other day. And we're talking about about things, about finances and, and, you know, people, you know, struggling in their finances. And and I'll tell you this, that we we have had moments where things were tight. But our previous pastor, she would always, she would always say out of Proverbs 37 and 25. I got to go there, sorry. (laughs) It wasn't part of my notes. I hope it's 37, 25. Huh? It ends in Proverbs. Yes, here it is. 37, 25. I have been young and I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. As a young Christian, she would quote that as long as I can remember, all the time, all the time, that she's never seen the righteous forsaken and begging for bread. Did I say Proverbs? Maybe it's Psalms. It's Psalms, sorry. Psalms 37, verse 25. I have been young and, I've been, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaking his children and begging for bread. We've never had to beg for our food. I've quit jobs that paid a lot of money to be on the mission field, to be in ministry. And we've never, ever went without. Matter of fact, I told somebody one time, I, I said, you know what? They go, aren't you afraid? I said, no. I said, being in this job and getting paid this good salary, I'm comfortable. I like the money that I'm making. I'm very comfortable. I said, but you know what? I know how to live by faith. I know how to walk out every day trusting that God's going to provide my daily bread. There's no fear in that. You know what my greatest fear was working in a job that paid well? Is that I was going to get complacent. And that I was going to get too comfortable. And that's why I don't stay in a job for very long. It's because this is where I need to be. This is where God has called me. And this is where he's going to provide. This is the kingdom. This is the citizenship that he has given to me. I'm going to wrap up with this and we'll pick up next week. Galatians 5 and 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit to the yoke of slavery. For freedom, for liberty, for unrestrained citizenship, Christ did what he did for our freedom. And when we don't exercise that citizenship that he has bestowed on us 
sacrificially, we are literally going back and putting ourselves back in bondage. You understand? Satan cannot bind you. I know we have been taught, but the reality is, how can Satan bind humans who believe in Jesus when Jesus destroyed that? Amen. If, if, if you learn nothing else in my time here, to, in our time together, for however long it takes, is we must understand who we are in Christ and what he has given us and how to walk in that. I am crazy enough to believe that we can change our community, that we can change our state, we can change our nation, we can change the world. If we truly understood who we are, we walk around in shackles, not because Satan has put us there, but because we have hindered and hobbled ourselves. I can't, I won't, I'm not. Think about the language that we use. I mean, understand, I'm not talking about name and claim, but I'm not talking about this hyper ultra faith. I'm talking about just do what the word says and, and do it with everything you have. Look, professions are great, but profession without action means nothing. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, and do nothing to express my love for her means absolutely nothing. Well, the same kind, I love you, 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 and we do nothing, that means nothing. You love me? <clears throat> Let's stand. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just begin to, to pray. And just seek the Lord's face this morning. Look, I, I will finish up next week, but I, I want us to begin to, to, to exercise this. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to get past what we have put as limitations in our lives. No one limits us but ourselves. We do have physical limitations. I understand that. But if we're not pressing all the way to that physical limitation to see really how far we can push, then we are still limiting ourselves. Spirit, soul, and body. If our nation of founders just said, the British are too big. The British are too powerful. They have navies. They have armies. They have money. They have been around for thousands of years. Who are we to come against the greatest empire that the world knows? But a few men inspired by the Holy Spirit, understanding that their very providence in this new world came from God himself and no one else. Established a framework for us to walk in. And how much greater is the framework that Christ has given us? So this morning, as we are, as we're praying and seeking the Lord and trying to understand how do we respond to this? I'm, I'm, I'm not an altar call person, but I want you to respond as the Holy Spirit leads you. No matter what it looks like, if it's prayer at your seat, if it's coming to the altar, if it's going to have another pray for you, you respond as the Spirit leads you because this is your life with Christ, not mine. And I'll facilitate whatever the Holy Spirit needs and requires of us. But I can't confer freedom upon you, as Benjamin Franklin said. Freedom and liberty in your citizenship in Jesus 
must be achieved by you. So we'll take a few moments and to just pray. If you need prayer, we'll pray for you. If you want to come up to the altar, come up to the altar. If you want to pray where you're at, pray where you're at. But we must get beyond our own limitations and trust that Jesus has given us all good things in our citizenship in him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus.
Father, we thank you that your word has rested upon our hearts. It has filled our, our souls, our intellect, and it has stirred the spirit within us, Father, that, Lord, we are free. We are free. We are free. There is nothing that restrains us in this life from walking out the fullness that you have in front of us. So, Lord, I just speak your word upon your people, Father, that it just rests upon their hearts. It rests upon their minds. It rests upon their lips. Hallelujah. That, Lord, this community will never be the same. can't be the same when your people understand who they are and walk in the fullness of the anointing that they possess. So Father, they are empowered, they are commissioned, they are at liberty to walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Yes. amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Y'all be dismissed. No. <laughs>